Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. And here we are with another episode for Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton. I'm Dan Hurst, and we're talking about the things that you can do in your ministry that will make a difference. Uh, Some of it immediate, some of it long-term. We're talking about the physical stuff, well, obviously the spiritual stuff. Today we're talking about something that's near and dear to, I think, probably everyone who listens, and that's preaching for revitalization and replanting. Just the whole process of going through your sermon preparation and getting ready for Sunday morning. Uh, Mark Clifton, of course, is here to to talk about that. Uh, how, let me ask you something. How yes. many sermons have you prepared in your life? Four. <laughs> so, okay, so Mark Halleck, how many sermons have you prepared? I mean, I, it really, you know, I just keep pre- I change them a little up here and there, but basically I got about four, pretty much. Mark, we're here with Mark Halleck, and uh, Mark is the pastor of Calvary in uh, Inglewood here. We're in his church using his equipment. And so we're grateful that Mark is letting us be here and doing. He's a he's a like an all time guest on this podcast. He's my buddy. Man, I love you guys. And I uh, love Dan. The three of us. We just love having you with us. So pull up a chair, sit with us, and we're going to talk about how to prepare and present sermons in revitalization. Mark, yes. How many sermons have you prepared in your life? I think five. Five. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I, have I, already, I already took. Oh, that you're joke. more spiritual. Be, that's yeah, obvious yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I don't know, man. Honestly, Dan, that's a great question. It is a great. question. I don't even know how to answer that. I mean, it's there's a lot. Hundred, hundreds. Hundreds for hundreds. sure. Hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. I've been preaching for over forty five years and uh, Sunday mornings and some Sunday nights and lots of other times and yeah, yeah probably four or five. I mean, we preach through, ones. I mean, you know, we, we tend to preach uh, through books of the Bible here at Calvary and man, we preach through John. And when I was before we build a team of preachers now, we've got yeah. a team, but those first few years, I think I was 110 sermons in the gospel of John. Wow. That's a lot of sermons. That's a lot of sermons. Um, so I don't know. It's a great question. It's a good question. Well, here's the answer to that question. The answer what? to the question is how many sermons have you prepared? The answer is all of them. Oh, and so you, I see where he's going with that. That was good, Dan. I that know. was good. That's why he's the host of this That's show. right. I learned that in seminary. That's good. <laughs> I didn't learn it well, mind you, but I, I learned it. Let's, let's talk about sermon preparation because uh, a, a lot of people spend too much time in sermon preparation, and a lot of people, it's obvious, don't spend enough time. Yeah, that's so, true. So let's just talk about that. What? How do you, first of all, decide what are you going to preach? Yeah, let's talk about what to preach in revitalization. We've said before, Mark, that sometimes you go to a dying and declining church, and they've sort of had what we call Bible bingo. Yeah, it's been yeah, Every yeah. Sunday's been a different text, a different emphasis. There's no continuity. And really the best way to really communicate the gospel the story of Christ to people is through really a series, obviously many times a book, a whole entire book of the Bible, or sometimes you know trying to preach an entire book of Romans, you know, yeah. in a month that's a lot. It takes. Time. I'm just kidding, out a month. It t- takes, but <laughs> that's, some, <laughs> that'd be a, that's your rough four sermons right there. You, you, you got to talk real fast, <laughs> but you know maybe maybe you preach the first you know ten chapters of Romans and then go to something else and then a few months later come back in the next five chapters or something. But the point is there should be some continuity. Mostly though, you need to preach Christ. Amen. That's right. You preach and I do agree with our brother from all of Scripture. Charles Spurgeon, you know, preach Christ in every message, get to the cross in every message. Yes. You gotta hop a hedge, get there anyway. But but preach Christ in <laughs> yes. every message because Absolutely. Christ is what changes people's hearts. Amen. And if you've got cold and different church members, you want to get their hearts to warm to the gospel. You can't preach the gospel enough to them. That's right. So that's talk exactly about that right. for a no, second. No, that's so good. And, and I would agree with you. I mean, I think, um, you know, what we do here at, at Calvary is we typically are preaching through a primary book mm-hmm. uh, through the year. The summers, uh, we, t- we tend to focus on the Psalms. Okay. So we're making sure we're trying to go New Testament, Old Testament. We'll do a couple vision series where yeah, we, we right. cast vision and yeah. share. But for the most part, it's a pretty steady uh, just expositional, verse by verse preaching that is Christ centered. Yeah. At the end of the day, um, boy, we do not want to uh, ingrain in our people a, a legalistic heart. We want to raise them up in a way that they they love Jesus. Their heart is warm to the gospel, as you put it, and that will come through in our preaching. And I'll tell you, if you aren't in love with Christ, don't expect your people to fall in love with Christ. Yeah, that's true. And the pulpit is our primary, not the only. 
but it's a primary uh, place week by week by week where we get to preach Christ and our love for Christ and primarily his love for us. You know, one of the one of the most encouraging things in my own ministry is in my preaching, the way I, I try to phrase things so that it really glorifies Christ and it really lifts him up. And and then when I hear some of our the young men in our church that get up and read scripture and expound on scripture and they use some of those same phrases. Mm, yes. It's just yep. it's just I, I'm, it's just such an honor to be able to instill that in them as it's been instilled in me. Well, it's more a lot of this is more caught than taught. Yeah. It really is. It is. And what and so what are they catching from us? That's yeah. something we need to in think that, about. And hopefully they're catching Christ. Amen. Not not our personalities, That's right. not our winsomeness or our well, humor, but, but, but Jesus. Christ. And you know what we normally do at Linwood, what I like to do is I preach through a book, you know, a New Testament book, an Old Testament book, but from time to time I'll also I'll preach a narrative like the life of Moses. Oh, that's good. Or I'll, I'll preach something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Or I'll just preach on the on the Sermon on the Mount. So we, we will sometimes pull out and just do something like that. Yeah. A life of David. Um, there's great. something great about narrative stories for people anyway. Absolutely. And so sometimes verse by verse doesn't always get to the whole narrative of a person's life. You can't you can't put it all together yeah. like you can yeah. if you say we're going to preach the life of Moses. We're going to start here and go through this. So sometimes we that's do that. That's good. I like but that. Preaching Christ constantly and uh, and without any 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 kind of apology for that's what right. we're doing. Amen. That's right. Amen. Let me ask you, you a, a practical question about all of that. Do you preach in such a way that people can take their own notes? What I do is. I usually preach and ask them to give me the notes so I'll know what I said. <laughs> uh, this is probably where Mark and I are a little different. I'm, I'm more structured yeah. and clear outlines, clear sub points. Uh, and part of that is I want it to be really clear for yeah. our listeners. At the same time, I think you've got to be faithful to your personality. You do. I mean, in preaching, um, you know, I've heard it said that, uh, I think actually Tim Keller said this once, that if you if you just listen to one preacher or influenced by one preacher, you become a bad copy of that preacher. Mm -hmm. Um, If you only listen to two preachers, you just get confused. Mm -hmm. But if you listen to many preachers and learn from many preachers, that's when you find your own voice. Yeah. And And, and it's taken, it it takes a while to find your voice and you only find it as you preach. That's right. But you know, it's taken me years, but I I know when I go in the pulpit, I know what I, I generally speaking, I have about three and that's really I know that's really unusual. I have about three three points, three three things I want to get across. And then at the end, I want to show them how that relates to where they are and how Christ can help them with that or how they can lean into Christ for that or how Christ solves that within in their life. I just want about three things yep. and how Christ brings all that together. Three things, sometimes four Love things, it. sometimes two things. I don't want to be over complex with this. Yes, no, You've that's right. you got to realize that a lot of people sitting out there listening don't even, unfortunately— don't even open their Bible all week. That's right. And yep. so you've got to come at it not trying to impress them as though you're teaching a seminary course, yeah. but but where does it affect them in their life? Yes. And I, it's a different process altogether, I think, in many ways. And um, if you're reaching the community you're in, which I hope you're beginning to reach some lost people, right? Yeah. It's just being mindful. I think it's just being loving and hospitable to just, you know, it's not dumbing anything down. No. It is being thoughtful I, to be a good communicator. When I was in, uh, in Montreal, we started a church in Quebec, in Montreal, Quebec, and uh, uh, we had a, a Lebanese young man who was a, a chef, and he would come on Sunday mornings and uh, really was really eager to learn everything, but he'd never been experienced any Christian faith whatsoever. Mm. And so one Sunday morning, I was always saying things like, well, you know the story of, you know the story of. So I said, well, you know the story of the Good Samaritan, and he stood up. And he said, I don't know any of these stories. Would you kill me the stories? Oh he, he had really no did. idea. He was like, he come no on, Pastor. Idea. I've yeah. never heard these stories. And wow. I was like, you know what? Even though he was from a non-Christian background, there are probably a lot of people in yes. your church, when you say the story of the prodigal, they don't really know what that they is. They don't know. That's exactly right. And you need right. to stop and take some time if you're going to explain that and, and, and let people That's know. That's really good. Oh, at Christmas time, we had a, a young woman at church who was very honest about it. She says, I don't know what Christmas is. Mm. She says, I think it's just the time you open presents and, mm-hmm. you know, there's trees and so forth and so on. And she said, you talk about Jesus being born. And she said, well, there were a lot of people born around Christmas. Mm. You know, what, wow. You know, what? what is that? And she was very honest and transparent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, it's amazing that even in America today, there are people that just don't get it. They you know, one don't. of the things, one of the things, this is a different off the topic, but one of the things, but, you know, it's on my show, so I can be off the topic <laughs> I want to. But one, one of the things... 
I, 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 as a replanting pastor, I would go to the funeral homes and say, look, if you need someone to do a funeral for someone who doesn't have a pastor, I'd be glad to do it. We should do a podcast on that, by the way. Yeah. That's yeah. a real ministry and a challenging ministry. You'd be amazed at how many funerals I've had for people who had no pastor. And mm. you walk, I would walk in and I'll sit down with the family. I did this just not too long ago. A, a lady in her 70s had died. There's the husband. He's in his 70s, the three grown kids, right? Sit down and... They don't have a pastor. Wow. They've lived in this city. They lived in Kansas City their entire lives. And when their mother dies, they do not have a pastor to call. Mm-hmm. So the funeral home calls them. So I sit down and I just say, tell me a little about your mother. Well, she liked to garden and she liked to go to Branson and she liked to go to the boats and gamble. Okay. Did your mother ever go to church? No, I don't think so. Wow. Did she ever have a favorite hymn? No. Did you have a favorite Bible story? No. These are people who grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. Wow, that's incredible. People at yeah. the end of their life, they have no, we don't, sometimes we live in such an evangelical bubble, yes. ghetto, we that's don't right. realize how little people know. Mm-hmm. So that's, that should inform your preaching as well if you're reaching people. So preach Christ. Yes. Preach clearly. Yep. Preach the scripture. That's what we do. That's number one. What was the number two? It. What do we that's do now? Well, the, the, the thing to, we have to address is how much time do you spend mm. getting ready? Yeah, in your I sermon know. preparation, I see guys all the time who spend twenty hours yeah. in sermon prep. They call it sermon prep. I guess that's okay. I'm just an old curmudgeon. I don't like that term. I don't what know where it what came bugs from. you about that term? I never growing up. A Dan's dad and my dad were pastors back in the fifties and sixties. I never heard my dad say to Dan's dad, "Hey, Harold, I'm going to go down to Starbucks and do my sermon prep." It just you know, my dad would go to study. He'd say, "Yeah, I'm going to go study right now." Yeah. I, I don't know. Sermon prep just okay. it sounds too <laughs> just, trendy. Okay. Like I'm hip. Yeah. Like I'm really. Yeah. I don't. We, I don't think of them as preppers. Yeah, you know, so yeah. I was like <laughs> prepping thought, for the end like times. Sermon you know? prep. What do you like? I don't know. This might be a generational. Thing. It might be. This might be a generational. Okay, thing. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. But listen. But it's study. You're studying. You're studying. Your study the, that's You're, right. We don't want to cheapen it. Right. That's what prep for me. It's like I know. It's like I'm sermon prep. Yeah. You know. I get it. I'm doing my sermon prep today. It's like. What? No, I'm with you. I get and it. First of all, preparation for me, and this is for Mark Clifton, it's not a sit down one time and do it. It's mm-hmm. the whole week. Amen. God's preparing Amen. my heart the whole week. I'm marinating on that text the whole week. I'm thinking about that the whole week. I'm praying about that yes. the whole week. As I encounter my people, I'm thinking about how, what they're going through in their life. My, I don't sermon prep in, mm-hmm. in, a, in a few hours. Right. My whole week is really yeah. being prepared spiritually. Now, I do my study in a certain mm-hmm. part, mm-hmm. and the study is, here's the text, here's what I want to say, here's some background information, here's how I can make it clear. But I'm going to be frank with you. When I'm preaching to 40 people on a Sunday morning, and I'm going to give maybe 25 minutes of 30 minutes of, of preaching, you know, you little mm-hmm. greeting and you yep. read Scripture and you pray, 20, 25, 30 minutes. I've been doing this for 45 years. M- I don't need I don't need to spend twenty hours yeah. on twenty minutes. Okay, let me ask you this, because you and I both have a very high view of preaching. Oh, so for extremely. listeners, a very high view. But what would you say to the guy who says, "Listen, if you're not spending twenty to thirty hours, you aren't serious about preaching would, the word." I would say there isn't one sermon recorded in the New Testament. Now, there's a lot of sermons preached in the New Testament that aren't recorded. Let me repeat that: there are a lot of sermons that were preached in the first century that aren't recorded. However, of all the sermons recorded in the New Testament, the person that preached that sermon did not have any foreknowledge. No one told him to be prepared. He preached it at the, on, on site without any preparation. It was a spontaneous sermon. It was a spontaneous sermon. Every one of them. Filled with the Spirit. I'm telling preaching you. The, preaching I'm the I'm telling word. you. Yes. Now, you, I'm not telling you to go to the pulpit Sunday morning no, and right. not be prepared. Sure. Yeah. But I'm telling you that if you are truly walking with Christ... He can do so much with you that you couldn't mm-hmm. begin to imagine. You don't have to depend on 25 hours of study to share 20 minutes of gospel. What are some of the, amen, I agree. What are some of the downsides? Like, what would you say to a young guy who's like, it's no, easier, man, I'm going to do it. It's much hours. easier to spend time studying than to spend time dealing with people. Say that again. It's easier to spend time studying than spend time with people. People are messy. That's right. People people drain you. People, you, you, you hang out with sheep, you smell like sheep, yep. right? Yep. But you can hang out in your Starbucks or your coffee shop or your office and be in sermon prep and feel like, hey, I'm... Re-. And look, you can never do enough sermon prep. I mean, I, I can... I've preached for 45 years. I can go to a text that I've preached many times. I could stay there all week. You'll never, you'll never plumb the depths yeah. of all of that. And you will not exhaust any no, text. Yeah. But I got 20 or 30 minutes to yeah. share that message. How can I best share it with yeah. those people? Yeah. And I, I really think you can get to the place 
where you don't need to spend. You, as a replanting pastor, you've got to spend time with people. Yes. Yep. You've got to spend time Absolutely. in their lives. You've got to spend time in the community. You've got to get to know people in the community. You can't spend all of your time in a study doing sermon prep for a 25-minute yeah. sermon every week. Yeah. Now, some of the guys listening to us have to do Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Right. Yep. I want to encourage you to use some other resources on that, to find some Bible studies that you can do, some video series, have some other people lead some, so that you're mm-hmm. not carrying all three of those. That is a tremendous amount for one guy to do. Can I pipe something in here? Yes. This is also why I'm such a believer, and I know you are too, in raising up other preachers and teachers. Yeah, to share if that. You, you cannot be, and there's different reasons why I think some pastors... Um, I don't know. Have a hard time with that. It could be that you literally are the only guy who can preach or teach. But over time, if you're developing leaders, part of this is humbling yourself and recognizing, you know, I always try to tell our people, this is not Mark's pulpit. This is yeah. Christ's pulpit, yeah. you know. And so we need to raise up others. Not only is that healthier for me, for my family, it's healthier for the congregation. I know. I, there are many times I'll have a pastor call me and say, I need someone to fill my pulpit. Okay. Is that because you just want a guest speaker? No, I'm going to be out of town. There's no one to preach. How long have you been a pastor there? 15 years. And there's not one person that can right. stand up, yep. that you've raised up, that could stand up in front of that congregation and share a message. And that's a problem. Yep. That, that's a problem. You know, um, on a different subject real quick, uh, same subject but a different topic. I don't know, whatever I'm saying. I had a church one time reach out to me about becoming their pastor. And it was the only time in my whole life that a large church was interested in me. I wasn't particularly interested in them, but they were interested in me. Mm-hmm. It was a very large church. And so uh, they listened to all my sermons. They said they listened to over 50 of my sermons online, and they were very interested in me, and they looked at hundreds of candidates. Mm-hmm. And literally, they said, you know, and I said, I, look, I've never pastored a large church, not interested in pastoring. Don't think I have what it, but we'd love to meet with. So I went down, and my wife and I went down and met with them and, and visited with them, and the, the, the pastor search committee voted unanimously for me to be the candidate that they presented. Wow. I met with the elders. The elders asked me how many hours a week I spent in sermon preparation. And I was honest with them. I said, well, one sermon a week, maybe eight to ten hours. And I said, that's not all, not all in one hunk. I said, maybe four or five hours in some study and then a couple hours a day. And they said, we want a pastor who spends far more time than that in sermon study. Interesting. And I said, well, have you listened to my sermons? Oh, yeah, they're great. We love them. But we just think the pastor mm. ought to spend. And, and we had a parting of the ways because I didn't spend 20 hours a week because wow. the previous pastor had told them they had That's just the culture that It's was the created. culture. Yeah, and yeah. I'm concerned there's a culture that somehow or another really good preachers have to spend 20 hours a week. Let me just say this again for the people in the back, all right? You're, you're involved in sermon preparation all week long. Yes. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you as you're driving, mm. as you're dropping off your kids, as you're getting ready to go to bed. Be meditating on that. God mm. can be building that in your heart. Set some time away to study His Word mm. and, and to look at some other resources to put together a message, but then let the Holy Spirit marinate that in you throughout the week. I love it. Second thing we're going to talk about is collaboration. Yes. So number one, preach Jesus. Yep, yep. And, and, and in terms of how much time to spend in sermon preparation, balance that with being a pastor, being a dad, being a husband and being a missionary in your neighborhood. Yep. They yep. got to balance all of those. That's right. right. Why is collaboration so powerful? Collaboration. Well, tell them what I mean by collaboration. You tell them. Well, you I mean, I talked think, about when it I think of collaboration, one is, um, you know, I'm a collaborative leader. Like I love to be in groups of people. I love whiteboards. I love brainstorming, dreaming, uh, partly because I know that my knowledge is limited and God uses all kinds of different folks and different ideas. But I think when it comes to preaching, there's a there's something that, and I don't know where this is, that it's got to just be you alone with your 10 commentaries. Um, you know, for me as an extrovert, um, man, that, that kind of scares me. I mean, that's just kind of a nightmare situation. But I, when I get together with some, some buddies, some other pastors from other churches or whatever, and we can just kind of dream together and throw out ideas, and what do you think about this? Is this a terrible illustration or whatever? There's something really energizing about that, or even people in our church. You know, uh, Mark Dever does this, actually. He's got a group every week of men and women who he'll just kind of throw the rough draft um, of his sermon, his first draft, I should say, at this group and just say, what do you think? What connects, what doesn't? Um, one of the things I love about Dever is that humility of just right. going, these are the people that right. I'm preaching to. Do they get it? And Yeah, exactly. And so I think there can be great value. Um, one, it keeps us humble. 
Um, it also helps our people have a voice into the process. Um, that co- only collaboration can do that. Now, here's how you can collaborate. If you want to preach to the book of James, find some other guys, perhaps even online. You, know, you can go to any number of online communities of Southern Baptist pastors. Find some guys even online who are preaching through James and get together online yeah. on Zoom or yep. on FaceTime and talk about what you're preaching. Learn from each other or talk to your associational director of missions and say, are there some other guys that maybe I could meet with and you guys could collaborate on your preaching? I'm, I'm talking about it like yep. that. Yep. Also, in your own church, Every church should have a plurality of leaders. Yeah. Don't be afraid to give your outline, your thoughts to your deacons or yep. your elders yep. or some other people in your church and say, hey, help me. What do you think? Do you, what, what might God say to you about this? You know, there's a, the church, there's a church that I'm very fond of in, in a city uh, that I, I, in my city, the pastor is an incredible preacher. Mm. I mean, he's one of these guys that every time he preaches, it's like fire from heaven. Yeah. It is, it is powerful. And so I asked, and this is a big church of several thousand people. So I asked his executive pastor, he's a very young man, this pastor is. And I asked his executive pastor, I said, man, how does he do that? He said, well, um, he, he works on it throughout the week. But he said on Thursdays, he invites all of the staff into the chapel. And he basically goes through the whole sermon. Mm. And then he asks us to collaborate with him on it and finalize it. Wow, that's cool. Uh, that, that's what I'm talking that's about. That's really cool. That kind yeah. of collaboration is so powerful and so yeah. needful. So if you're a pastor, a bivocational pastor, all by yourself in a relatively normative mm-hmm. sized church, mm-hmm. try to find some other pastors in your region or if not online yeah. and learn to collaborate and say, hey, I'm preaching through James. I'm preaching on the, on the great commandment this week. Yeah. What, do you, what do you guys It learned? will only make your preaching better. It will. And it'll open up your mind to something. And sometimes you'll get stuck on something. It'll really help you see something totally different. That's exactly different. right. Yeah. That's right. All right. Well, one of the things that we can do is take all of this to heart and begin talking to other people who are also listening to the podcast. Yes. Because uh, you're, in a sense, collaborating with them and getting some information from them also on how they can take these things and apply them in their lives. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening to, uh, to our, our Revitalize and Replant podcast. Uh, Mark Clifton is here every every episode. To when talk I'm not about. 20 hours in sermon prep, I'm here. <laughs> You're not going to do that. No, I, look if you if you spend 20 hours, that may be what God wants you to do. So I, I don't mean that. I just yeah. I do think we need to balance it and be careful about it. And uh, I, I, I do. And I'll I'll call it sermon study. You can call it okay. Sermon that's right. prep. That's right. Whatever. Right. Hey, <laughs> uh, punch the tell them to punch the button, Dan. Oh yeah, you gotta you gotta you gotta subscribe you gotta to subscribe. the podcast. The Please. podcast needs your subscription. We it doesn't do. cost you anything. It doesn't even hurt. And no. uh, you can subscribe and become part of our our list of of people that that are on that are listening that are getting information about our podcast. Maybe mm-hmm. some upcoming podcasts. Will so send subscribe you some quickly because Dan and Very I quick. aren't getting any younger. <laughs> well, yeah, this and there's no know. guarantee how much longer we're going to be here. So we'd we're like hearing. you to subscribe while we're still on this. I'm, earth. I'm starting to hear trumpets. I don't know I about agree. you. All right, we'll see you the next time, folks. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board, where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.